Much of the story of Canada is the story of the railway that links it from sea to sea. And like any story, there is tragedy as well as triumph. Long before the completion of the Transcontinental Railway and even before Confederation, train wrecks are a part of the life of the railroad. Sometimes the causes are natural ones, provoked by the weather or the landscape. But most often they are the result of human error, a miscalculation or misunderstanding that sets the wheels of fate in motion. September 1st, 1947. Labor Day Monday. The last long weekend of the summer is all but over. The Manaki Special is one of two passenger trains that carry summer vacationers from Winnipeg, Manitoba to the Falcon Lake region of Northern Ontario. I'm going down on Friday night. It was a very busy packed train and it stopped a whole lot of places all the way along, letting people off. And then Sunday night, picked them all up again. There were virtually no roads into any of the places along the line at that time. So the train was pretty much it. The passengers who gather at stations along the line from Reddit to Malachi have left leaving until the last minute rather than catch the earlier train. The Manaki Special is made up of 13 cars. Two baggage cars are directly behind the engine. Next are nine passenger coaches built in the early 1900s and lit by gas lamps. At the rear are two steel-constructed parlor cars. This evening, engineer Gaylord Lewis is looking forward to the last run of the tourist season. At 63, he is just a few years from retirement. Trainman Gilbert Rougeau helps passengers board the train. Gil is looking forward to seeing his twin son and daughter later that evening. He usually works the rear of the train, but today he has traded positions with the other trainmen. Uh, Wally Douglas was uh, in seniority, was senior to my father, and uh, his position should have been at the uh, head end with the conductor. But uh, this, uh, this one evening, uh, Wally Douglas had said to my father uh, that he wasn't feeling that well and uh, would, my, would my father, Gil Rougeau, would he take, uh, take the front end and he would ride the tail end. Passengers Catherine Mackay and her husband had planned to take the earlier train home. We were sailing, going to stay, but this wind had dropped. It always does at that sort of thing. So we were, got the paddles out and everything else, but we just sort of floated on our own reputation, as Father said. So we finally got back to the cottage, and he said, well, we can't make that. And my mother said, well, I'll put a dinner on, and we can make the next piece. 12-year-old Ian Manson can't wait to sit in one of the coaches near the front of the train. I started to head towards the head end of the train to get a coach and my dad said no let's go back here well which happened to be the second last coach in the train 18 year old Bill Kwasnicia is part of a large group of young people from the local summer camp two coaches have been set aside for them at the front of the train but the Manaki conductor Fred Skogsberg is concerned that they will disturb older passengers and that's when he said to maybe the train men, you know, they're both in uniform, and he says, we're going to move these coaches to the back of the train. So he says, don't put the suitcases on now, we're going to switch. Each stop puts the holiday special farther behind schedule. At Malachi, it takes on more passengers, including Daisy Irvin, her husband, and their close friend, Joan Jarman. and I wanted to take the first train home. But it was such a gorgeous day in the last long weekend of the year, and my husband said, oh no, let's stay and take the second train. But I wasn't comfortable, it just seemed to be so hot and stuffy, and 
I could smell gas or something on that train. When the special pulls out of Malachi at 7.30 that evening, there are 326 passengers on board. The train is already an hour and a half late. So is the supercontinental out of Winnipeg. The eastbound passenger train is running in two sections, number two and number four. The Manaki special has orders to let both passenger trains pass. At 9.15 p.m., the Manaki special pulls into the siding at Vivian and waits there until the first supercontinental goes by. The Manaki receives a new order that allows it to continue to Dugald, 22 kilometers east of Winnipeg. There, it must take the switch and allow the number four passenger train to pass. As the Manaki heads back onto the main line, the Supercontinental pulls out of Winnipeg. The passenger train consists of 15 cars, all solid steel construction. Engineer John Gibson and fireman Hazen Laurie make up the engine crew. But tonight, there is an unofficial passenger riding with them. It was uh, my night off, and uh, it was a nice, beautiful night, first September, beautiful summer night, and uh, I uh, asked him if I could go to Reddit. It was a nice trip down there, you know, and that was a nice train to ride on. At 9.42 p.m., the number four arrives at Dougal. The engineer stops the engine on the main line, just past the station. We had a copy of this order to meet this Padner Extra Engine 6001 when we left Winnipeg. He had rights over us to Dougal. So that's as far as we could go to the east switch. At the time, Order boards at either end of the station are red, indicating to both trains the need to stop to pick up new orders. The Dugald station operator then gives the Manaki a green light, meant to tell the engineer that he has no new orders and to proceed as planned. Once the Manaki pulls into the siding and allows the Supercontinental to go by, it will have a non-stop trip into Winnipeg. Normally, the brakeman from the passenger train would throw the eastbound switch as a courtesy to the other train. Tonight, there isn't time. The Manaki special is already approaching the station. As they were coming into Dougald, my dad uh, came into the baggage car and they looked out the, uh, the side door and they observed the signal was green and my father made the statement that uh, Oh, this is great. I'll be able to get in and see the twins tonight. We have a clear board. The engineer of the passenger train sees the special rounding the bend. He dims his engine lights to allow the Manaki crew to see the switch. Jack Gibson, the engineer, was sitting on his seat and he was reading the order and his fireman, Azen Laurie, was standing here looking through the window looking ahead and I was in the middle of the cab behind the boiler head I couldn't see anything and all at once Hazen mentioned he said say says that fella's not heading in and he said by golly we'd better get off all of a sudden I heard this frantic whistle blowing of the train and the train seemed to be doing this jumping on the rails. He was probably braking so hard, obviously aware of what was going to happen, trying to stop. September 1st, 1947, 10 o'clock in the evening. The Manaki Special has failed to take the siding at the east switch at Dougal. It is traveling at almost 50 kilometers an hour. On the main line ahead of it is the supercontinental passenger train. The Manaki slams on its brakes. In one of the passenger coaches, 
Catherine Mackay's husband reacts to the sound of the brakes. We heard this noise underneath us, and he said, they're dropping sand. And they're trying to slow down the train. And then he dropped it again, and he took my head. And he put it down in his lap. And held, held my head down, and he said, we're going to hit. It's the noise that I remember now. And all I remember seeing was this headlight coming. Now, I don't know how, I have no idea how far it was away, but it couldn't have been very far. And I realized that I'd better get out of there. They got off, so I better get off. With that, we hit, and it was like the worst thing I've ever gone through. It was absolute stop, bang. And not a coaster, nothing, just a bang. And uh, I looked out the side, and I could hear explosion. And then there was just like a psh, like that, and all, all the different steam pipes on both engines, if you can imagine them. Terrible roar of steam with this steam blowing straight up into the sky. Windows on farm homes six kilometers away are shaken by the sound of the collision. The force of the impact drives the supercontinental back a full coach length. The Manaki engine folds like an accordion. The two engines were nose to nose and just almost welded together. They were still upright on their wheels. The tender of the 6046 was down on the cab, and the cab was hammered right down onto the boiler head. The second baggage car and the first three wooden passenger coaches go over the side of the embankment. The baggage car explodes into flames. And the whole countryside lit up with these pinch gas tanks under each coach, which they used in those days for the lighting facilities in the coach. That's what it was. The whole thing lit up just like, like it was unbelievable. It was awful. There was uh, explosions and fire, and I saw uh, the body of a woman very pink dress, and she was like a doll. She was thrown, and she sort of fell to the back. And, and then there was other bodies. And they were coming from behind us. I do remember sort of coming to and feeling heat. And my thoughts were I'm going to be burned alive. Fire rips through the toppled coaches, chasing passengers down the length of the train. But finally, Hugh said they were blowing up behind and we haven't time. So he kicked through the window. He said, okay, you gotta get out. Catherine Mackay and her husband jump from their train car, staring in disbelief at the destruction around them. Nobody could go back in the carriages. They were going up as fast as from one boom and then another because they were all gas. A Dugald resident just leaving for work witnesses the crash. He finds six people in the flaming debris he is able to save five, including a little girl. The sixth is a man buried to his hips in burning wreckage, his clothes on fire. There is nothing anyone can do. Two men from one of the rear coaches try to save passengers in the second and third cars. They pull three people out. Two are decapitated. One has no legs. Rescuers find Menaki engineer Gaylord Lewis slumped unconscious over the controls of his engine. He dies on the way to hospital. Dazed survivors stumble into nearby fields. All they can do now is watch. You're seeing things, but you're not really taking anything in. I think there's this horrible, shrill, uh, hissing sound of steam and, and, and realizing that the I guess so many people seem to be running. 
But you could see the flames working their way down the coaches. They were gas lamps in the coaches. And they'd see a flash and then it would go along and another flash. We knew there was not going to be much left. There was a lot of people crying, sounds of people crying and uh, not knowing where to go, what to do, I guess, those that got off the train. I said the Lord's Prayer. And after that, the Lord is my shepherd. Everything I need. And thank God for saving my life to help these people. He and his wife and their son, uh, all three got killed. Friday, September 5th, 1947. At the site of the train wreck at Dugald, another body is found under the Manaki Special's overturned baggage car. A total of 31 are believed dead, with another 85 injured. All are from the holiday train. Believes there would have been more casualties if the Manaki conductor Fred Skogsberg and trainman Gil Rougeau had not switched the two crowded camp cars to the end of the train. They saved us all. There would have been quite a few of us dead. You know, there wouldn't have been only 40. There would have been quite a bit more because uh, we were packed, two cars packed of young people, your age, my age, you know, I mean, 18, 19, 20, 21. Throughout that week, funeral services are held for the dead, including trainman Gil Rougeau. Wally Douglas, the man he traded places with, survives. After the crash, uh, my mom was forced to, uh, go, to go to work. Uh, my grandmother was given the task of raising us children, and uh, my grandfather also uh, came in to, to assist. They should have been retired enjoying their golden years and ended up uh, raising uh, myself and my sister. But I, I feel I missed out on a lot, not having a father. For those who cannot be identified, the city of Winnipeg holds a special civic ceremony. A policeman on motorcycle has to flag down an approaching passenger train so it will not interrupt the procession. A coroner's inquest and Federal Board of Transport Inquiry investigate the tragedy. According to the orders, they would, should have taken the, uh, the siding at Dougal to yield to the uh, eastbound train. The engineer on the uh, camper special uh, didn't see the headlight, assumed that they had a clear board and uh, never attempted to uh, stop. They didn't have to stop there for any reason. The coroner's jury blames the accident on the Manaki crew's failure to follow written orders. 
A month later, the Board of Transport's inquiry does the same. The tragedy changes the way trains are run on the Manaki Line. For some, the railroad is part of Canada's history, the tie that first binds East and West into a single nation. For others, these ribbons of steel are part of a more intimate experience. For them, the disaster at Dugald Station will forever be a part of who they are and how they view the world. There's no question that when I go through Dugald, uh, even today when we drive by there, that it's, I certainly remember it. It's not something that I'll ever forget in my lifetime. But I think about it on Labor Day, when it's Labor Day weekend and people are closing their camps. I think about it. I think of what could have been. Well, it's left a lasting impression, so much so that I have not been on a train since and won't. I'll never go on a train, never. I'm thankful that I survived. I've lived an extremely, extraordinarily happy life. I've traveled the world. I've raised three children. That's all I can think about. I don't want to think about this anymore. That's the way I feel. I'm thankful. God was willing to spare me.